I just find some chips. You wouldn't have a chance. Want that? Oh god! Oh god, it's coming out of me! Oh! Dude! I'm so sorry! Oh, I should not have had that Chipotle burrito! Oh lord! Oh, it's coming out too fast! We'll get out of here. Yellow, go for Barney. Hello everyone, welcome back to another episode of E-Review. Today I will be reviewing A Quiet Place Part 2. And something I wanted to instinctively say right off the bat is, although I was making fun of how quiet you had to be at the beginning of this video with my little skit, it was one of the most, like, suspenseful films I've seen in a very long time. Because a lot of times, especially with, like, action movies and, like, horror, it's, like, very on the nose and very fast-paced, especially because they're trying to set you up for all those, like, jump scares. And something that they maintained in A Quiet Place throughout the film was the fact that it didn't just feel like a bunch of jump scares. I felt like there was real like terror and horror for things that seemed very casual and normal like like eating fruit or drinking water or carrying a baby around in a box so it doesn't make enough noise to get eaten by an alien. You know, all the normal things from today's society. Right off the bat before I even jump into the, the review, it's been a year and it was supposed to come out last March. Believe me, I was one of the few people who was like, yes, I cannot wait for the end of March so I can watch A Quiet Place Part 2. And the question I know you're all waiting to hear is, was it worth the wait? Now, to be fair, this movie Movie, like didn't choose to be pushed, but it was worth the wait. And with that, let's go right on into the review. I'm gonna break this down into five categories, and when I rate it at the end, um, basically every category can get either a full star, a half star, or a quarter star. Although if every category you get a quarter star, that's kind of like risque, and you might as well just skip the movie. I'm doing that to help the segment have a little more clarity for everybody out there. So I'm gonna start off with the story. Now the story of this film picks up right after the events of the first one, but it does start off with like a 10 minute sequence of the past. And when the movie first started, I was a little um, thrown aback because it wasn't as high stakes as the trailer made it out to be, but it was very much, oh, this is a normal day society, this is very normal. And I was like, well, there's not a lot of tension, it's just a lot of like normalness happening. But like, as it escalated, I felt like my adrenaline and my like thought process of, there are way too many people gathered and chatting and laughing at this baseball field. Like all the stuff was like setting my anxiety. And then we jump back in right after the events of the first one. And basically Emily Blunt um, is taking her children and trying trying to find a way to help others because they discovered the thing that her daughter can do with the feedback from her, her hearing aid. And so that brings them to this abandoned factory where they run into Killian with a friend from their past. And the only reason that you know that they're, that they're friends is because in the beginning they're all together with each other at, a, at the baseball field. And it did bring a lot of like, well, can you trust your friends even after like the apocalypse happened? Or has everybody changed and everybody's thrown out of there that you can't really do anything with them? Really, it, it brought in like this whole questioning aspect without going too much into a zone that I don't approve of. I'm gonna get to that zone towards the end because that's when it deserves to be talked about. It breaks down into like three different story arcs in this film because Emily Blunt's son, while they're running away from the farm, gets hit by a bear trap and he's forced to stay inside this little like fallout shelter that's in the factory. He can't walk and he's really injured and that forces him to stay there with the baby and while he's there he's sick and the air tank that allows the baby to breathe in the box that keeps it safe is running out so that creates a story for Emily Blunt and she has to go out and find more medicine for her son and also more air tanks for her baby to breathe. The other story arc is between this new character that was their father's friend from the past and the daughter who discovered the feedback of her hearing aid. So uh, the daughter's going off to uh, this radio station because it's the first time they've ever heard a frequency with a direct line of where to go. They go off on their, uh, on their story arc to go figure out where this radio station is because she 
figured out how to broadcast her hearing aid frequency and that it will dispel the aliens long enough for you usually to have the upper hand and survive. There are more dips and turns. It, it felt very epic fantasy despite having a whole bunch of horror elements. Because of that, it just felt so original and like I didn't feel like sad that they made a sequel to a film. It felt very like honed in and true to the first one. Especially because the thing I wanted to talk about is in the trailer they talk about like how not every human deserves to be saved. And anybody who's watched The Walking Dead um, and any kind of other apocalyptic film has really gotten into that mindset because it gets like so dark and we don't know like without like a society how we would react together. It didn't go into those stereotypes. It kind of made its own thing while also acknowledging that that also happens when society falls away. Um, and that was a relief because it didn't become a plot. So let's go into the acting. Something that I loved in this film that they didn't really do it in the last one, the last film, A Quiet Place, was mostly about the parents um, trying to figure out a way to take care of their children so they can survive in this new apocalyptic environment where they can't talk or do anything that will make noise to attract the monsters. So it's very much the parents taking care of the child. And something that they did in this film is they twisted that. While Emily Blunt is still the mother and taking care of her children, they kind of have to figure out a way to do that themselves because all she can do is tend to their wounds, but if she's not there, they kind of have to figure out what tools they have to survive. Especially when you're not, they're not always going to be there to take care of them. That's something that was really prevalent with all the acting and what the, like, the different tones that were going on. Especially because like there were no bad performances. There was nobody who detracted from the film. It felt very cohesive and, and one. And like it was one of those films where I, I really feel like the casting was very like like might have been a slow process because everyone from the first one seemed to really fit with every new character that came out of it. And I don't know if that's because of the first scene I told you about where they're all on a baseball field and so it kind of has a community aspect. It, but it did definitely still feel like it was the same world. And even though there's more people we're seeing, they are still part of that world. It didn't detract from it at all. Now let's dive into directing. John Prensininski was able to turn a horror film into this very, like, fantastical, like, survival film without falling into, like, the survival film tropes. The suspense that was built and, like, the sound design was so very tailored to his vision that it didn't feel like anything was out of place. Like, even in the beginning, it could have gone bad. And that was something that I was worried about because it started off so normal. It's like, well, this could just be the worst thing ever because, like, you're showing the actual jump. In the trailer, they were like, oh, oh, we're driving, oh, dad's in trouble. So it was very action forward. So I thought, okay, so it's just gonna be action forward beginning. No, like in the, in the beginning, you see like when the aliens arrive and then the, the town dealing with it and then even them getting hunted. As a director, him appearing in the film didn't seem like a side tangent or vanity thing. And, and it actually fueled the plot because we kind of got like little Easter eggs and like throwbacks to the first film in, in that first first 10 minutes but it also allowed you to see like even uh, even then on the first day he was teaching his daughter who can't hear so she doesn't know when she's making noise different things to like look out for to survive kudos to him because when it when it cuts from the past to the present the way that he did it was so like well constructed that i didn't feel like out of place when we, all of a sudden we were back because it kind of used a moment that existed on that first day to bring us back to the end of the first film and i enjoyed that and something that i was worried when we got back to the first film that we would be like looking at the body of his like of him dead and to be fair my friend was like, well, they kind of like ate him alive. And I was like, I don't remember that, so I'm gonna believe you. And so therefore I'm not upset that he didn't show up when they came back to the future, but I mean, cause that would've been gnarly, like bad. Um, and like, you know, I mean like carnage and blood kind of way. And then I'm gonna dive into post-production. Things like sound and like different like CGI elements or any of that kind of stuff. Like how did the post-production enhance the film? And I went to go see this in AMC Dolby. It allowed us, us to surround ourselves in the sound and I was very priv like I was very aware that that had to happen because of how important the sound was because I've been watching interviews where he was talking about everything that happens is his control and his levels like it's all a soundscape that he created and listening to it 
with that surround environment, like voices were too loud, or like even when they were whispering, or when they were like calling for family on that first day, because you want to call for help either from a family member or for the police, even that was like, you could tell was too loud. And like the monsters, like they're like, they like kind of have like a crackly opening to when they're around. And even like that, like set me off because it kind of circled the, like the atmosphere. And so it was very precise and like every little moment, like for instance, like walking on sand to opposed to walking on bare earth, just that sound difference of how loud that could be was very chosen and precise. It really enhanced everything. And something that um, they improved, the creatures in this film, I thought looked even more realistic than the first one. I mean, there were some things that kind of reminded me more of than the last one of Stranger Things, things of like Demigorgon, but this one, cause like Netflix kind of makes it look like eh, sometimes in some episodes, but this one, like the face opened and kind of reminded me of like a snake or a lizard because it opened up like an antenna and it was like, it was like fueling in like the air for any sound that like was across it. And like, you didn't get precisely how it was working in the first film, at least I didn't, but like the, the monsters were so precise and the movement of them were so clear that you could tell what the monster was doing, even though they just shriek and have these scary sounds, like their faces were very much in on what was going on. So I'm gonna give these spoilers because I did give you more of a synopsis before, but this is the fifth thing I'm gonna review is the payoff. Payoffs sometimes don't work out. Sometimes the ending is not worth the journey. Sometimes it just makes you be like, why did I sit here for an hour and a half? That's how long a quiet place part two is. I didn't feel that way at all throughout the film. It like, even though we were going on three different journeys that all had to do with the same moment going on in society and the world, it didn't feel like it detracted from each other. Like whenever I was like, well, where's Emily Blunt? I, like, there she was, like, pull back into the plot. Or whenever I was like, well, where's the baby in the sun? There he was again. It was like, so like, anytime like you were almost like, well, this, let's, we've seen a lot, and how's this affecting them back at the factory? And it, it was very well edited uh, in that regard. Basically, the daughter goes off on her, her own because her brother is injured and her mom's trying to take care of the newborn. Um, so she goes off on her own to help the other people survive. Emily Blunt begs uh, Killian's character to go after her, and so they become this little duo that, like, you don't know whether or not he's a good person or not. And, like, they use the fact that she, um, the daughter doesn't hear to influence her opinions on things, because she can't hear if people are moving around her. She can't tell if people have left her. All she has is what's in front of her, and how that affects her life. The daughter trusting this man that she used to know before everything ended really developed into a story story arc that I was very interested in to see, especially because they have to go to an island for the radio tower, and when they get to the docks to find a boat to leave, they run into all those humans that are the bad ones trying to abduct and like attack fellow survivors. I feel like that character redeemed himself and really showed that he was there to help everyone, use sound to lure the monsters there to free them, and then use a boat to get to the island. Um, and then when they get to the island, we find out that the reason why the island Island is saving this radio tower is because apparently the creatures can't cross water. Maybe it's deep water. I don't know if it's like if, if, if like a, a creek is a problem. That was a new revelation that I didn't know. It was a very important thing to find out. So I was like, oh, so now they have this way to survive. And then the daughter kind of brings what she can do to this town that was such a huge moment, like because the town is almost back to normal society because the monsters can't get to them. So like they have loud instruments. They are almost at back to normal, except that when they were at the dock, like boats got pushed out and one of the boats had a creature on it and so that's when they have to race to the radio tower with a creature following them luring them away from the like the people who were safe until they showed up and they use they use the, like the daughter's device to get to the radio tower and change the frequency so that it can ward off all the monsters and the reason why this is pivotal because it flashes back to Emily Blunt and the, the son's uh, perspective because by this point the son is trapped inside a furnace 
like it's broken down, there's not, there's no flames, but there's no air. So once it's inside, like you have a limited amount of air, but depending on how often you open the door, otherwise you will suffocate in there. <laughs> Only two ways of getting out of there, either hoping the air lasts until someone takes care of the monster or risking your life with the monster when you don't have any real weapon to defend yourself, especially because the daughter took the only weapon you have. But the son had the forethought to grab a radio because they, like he was told by his sister what she was doing, what frequency she was going to be on, and has been listening to it. Emily Blunt, who got medicine, returned to the factory and like the monsters coming in at them and she was able to lure it away long enough to get to her son with one fresh air tank to help them breathe even longer because the monsters still outside don't really have time to do anything because they don't have a weapon. The payoff was worth it because once the daughter actually is able to put the frequency on the air, it saved like the mother and son as well because they could use the radio to ward it off and regain control. And this is why it was even more pivotal and more of a payoff to me is like the first film was about the parents taking care of the children, but the end of the film, I thought it was so beautiful, was the fact that both of the children were the ones who were protecting the adults in the situation. And one uses like a bat to kill the a monster and the other one uses a gun to. It was such a huge suspenseful like music um up it take. And then that and then when it ended Ends, I was like, that was completely worth that ending. In all five categories, without a doubt, I would give this film five out of five. So if you have a chance, go see it. If you haven't been to the theater because you know you can watch things at home, I do think that this is a film that you want to see in theaters because even if you have surround sound, even if you have that, anything else, the tension of knowing there's hundreds of people in that auditorium, not really hundreds, we were still social distancing, but there were so many people there and every time somebody would like cough, I mean, all, hearts, hearts would stop for a second and then regain once we realized, we're, okay, we're all like hopefully vaccinated and safe. But like people would cough or somebody would get up or somebody's phone would go off and they almost sounded like it was coming from the movie. And I was like, oh, these people are gonna die. This is the sound effect that's gonna kill everybody. And then my friend was talking next to me and I was like, you are ruining it. You are going to reveal the fact that this monster is going to kill them. You are an idiot. Idiots. The band. But like, no, it added so much being around other people that I don't think the film would be bad um, at home, I just feel like that for a first viewing, you really want to be in the theater. So you know what your nerves could have done while watching that film. That's it. That's kind of like the end for my movie review. Um, um, I hope you guys enjoyed the skit at the beginning. Let me know in a comment if you guys want me to do more skits whenever I do e-reviews or book reviews. Um, I'll try to think of something better. Uh, I'm trying to get back into the like the scheme of things. I'm doing a reversal this week of the Fatboy Diaries and the movie review only because I have, I'm going on a trip next week and so I didn't realize how busy I needed to be to, in order to go on that trip. So my my intent and my hope is that my Fatboy Diaries will be on Saturday. And then the week after next, when I finally get home, is when I can start doing everything back on schedule. But my life has been exhausting, guys. It has been exhausting. Who knew writing, producing, and starring in a feature film would be a lot? I did. Wanna know why, how I did? Because I've done it before, but I wasn't thinking. As always, if you want to, you can Leave a comment, as I've said, like the video or not like it, your choice. Uh, if you're not subscribed, subscribe to my channel because if you're subscribed, you can tap the little bell button to get notified when I post more videos. And then also make it so you're always notified so the little algorithm doesn't like mess with our little like kinship that we're building, you know? You wanna know when I'm here. You wanna be like up in my like circle of like kinshipness, you know? Okay, that's it. Bye!